Welcome to the MyLifeInConcert.com podcast. I'm your host, Various Artists, and please join me as I travel back and revisit every live show I've seen from 1975 to the present. You know, some people go to concerts and their thing is to be, you know, more near the back. They don't want to be up at the front, sort of engaged. They want to sort of sit back away from the crowd. Hey man, I just want to hang out at the back and you know, take it all in, you know? Well, uh-uh, not me. I like to be really close. I like to be in the front row if I can. And in today's episode, I do even better than the front seats. Today's show was another concert going first for me. I not only got close to the stage, but parked my elbows upon it dead center, anchoring me in the best seat in the house for the whole evening. Now, there's a show coming up eight months down the line in the time frame where I do one better and actually sit on the stage during the show, but still. This was such a sweet spot, and it couldn't have worked out better, because the show itself was brilliant and mesmerizing as a restless and innovative artist and his exceptional band of musicians transported all of us into his new zone for a magical three hours. Hey everybody, this is the MyLifeInConcert.com podcast. I'm your host, Various Artists, and I invite you to join me for episode 19, concert number 13, Joe Jackson at Alumni Hall, UWO, or Western University as it's now known, London, Ontario, Canada, Monday, October 4th, 1982. And this episode is called Night and Day. Welcome listeners, both new and old, to the MyLifeInConcert.com podcast. I'd like to remind you to check out the MyLifeInConcert.com blog, where we have the original entry for this show that I wrote back in 2011, and it features uh, links to videos, music, and related ephemera, including the original program uh, that I got at the time of this concert. Also, you can go back, and there's lots of other entries for shows through the years. You can even peek at the next upcoming show so um, check out the website also like follow and subscribe where appropriate on Facebook Instagram and YouTube and also check out our Spotify channel with all of the playlists starting with MLIC prompt so I return to this same Western University or University of Western Ontario, as it was then known. I, I returned to Alumni Hall, their, their main concert hall venue there, to see the artist that Elvis Costello was most often pitted against or compared with, or, or I should say Joe Jackson was compared to him, and that is Joe Jackson. Now, this show was one month after that exciting class show. It was Excitement Incarnate. And of course, I uh, looked at that at episode 18. It was two months after Police Picnic 82, that worst concert experience ever that I covered off in episode 17. And seven months after that spirited OMD show that took place in a blizzard that I uh, look back on in episode 16. So 1982 indeed was the year that uh, my life as a regular and dedicated concert goer truly began. Not to mention that all of those shows that I mentioned, musically, they were excellent. Even the Nightmare on Wheels that was the Police Picnic 82, the music was excellent, especially the Talking Heads. Well, this Joe Jackson show made it four for four that year. And it's interesting looking back at those shows, how different each one was, uh, went from, you know, we went from synth pop to a lot of new wave acts to punk and reggae. And now this Joe Jackson show now, normally in the first few years of his career, well, even at this point, he would have fallen in the new wave category, but he was once again, moving into a new musical territory at this time. He, he seemed to have appeared from nowhere in the post-Costello spring of 1979 with his debut album, Look Sharp, and its enduring big hit, Is She Really Going Out With Him? Now, that was one of the first songs from the new wave. Not really, it not, wasn't punk, but from the new wave that broke through in America, and that was one of the first big hits to sort of catch on from any of the new artists. And of course... Uh, it was a very tuneful song, so it was sort of the palatable side of New Wave. But 
unlike a lot of some of the other sort of new wave bands who hit big, particularly in the States at that time, Joe Jackson deserved it. He was just that good. Look Sharp is an amazing album. It's got one of the all-time classic, you know, rock album covers. Um, and the single, it, it's not just good, it's great. So, yes, he was a more commercial end of the sphere. And, of course, I was hoping that more sort of louder and noisier and harsher stuff would be popular having said that he was damn good and he deserved the success that he got then and has had since his follow-up to that i'm the man came out later that year so two in a year and i think it's even better i think look sharp has more of the peaks but i'm the man really holds together as a unified album and here in canada anyway it repeated the success of look sharp both with the album as well as i'm the man becoming a hit single and over in england of course he had a massive uk hit with it's different for girls now after that first spark of the two albums Jackson started to shake things up in 1980. He released Beat Crazy, which had a more left field sound and feel. It incorporated on one hand more reggae and some dub elements, but I could also hear aspects of post-punk coming through. At the time, this was my favorite Joe Jackson album. Um, the second side is a bit of a mixed bag when I hear it now, but the first side I still think is perfect. And it was, again, this was my personal favorite back in the day, but it didn't really do very well for him. And this was also the end of the Joe Jackson band. But as his fan base was to find out, this was just the first of many genre switches and experimentations that was to come in his career. Now, he shifted gears once again the following year with Jump and Jive, which was a collection of faithfully uh, recreated covers of swing and jump songs from the 40s and that came out in 81 and for many like myself jump and jive proved to be a valuable history lesson introducing me to a genre of music i was largely unfamiliar with now i knew music from the 40s because that was my parents era and they would play um stuff like stuff from that era in the house like glenn miller for example glenn miller orchestra but that was really the sweeter, more commercial stuff. And it was differ. It's different than the cooler cuts Jackson was curating on Jump and Jive. Now, I loved Jump and Jive, but it's, it's really interesting when I think about it, because when that album came out, a lot of the tunes were about 40 years old in and around there. And at that time, the idea of music from the 40s and being 40 years, 40 years old, was like this music was made alongside when dinosaurs roamed the earth it seemed like a time so far back in time it might as well have been the 1800s and the irony is that this podcast in 2021 is 40 years on from the original album the same amount of time has passed between then and me talking now meanwhile it's been 80 years since sort of 80 years since uh, the time of that music and even though it's 80 years later that time frame feels closer to me now than when i was 40 years younger because in that time my musical interests and knowledge and the music i have explored and learned about from all through the decades means that a lot of this older music feels closer and more familiar to me than it did at that time. It's odd how that works. So that now brings us to 1982 and this tour and concert and its accompanying album, Jackson's Fifth Platter, Night and Day. Now, my recollection is that when it came out, it was a bit of a sleeper. It didn't really take off right away. And I'd heard the single Steppin' Out, and to be honest, when I first heard it, it I didn't really like it that much. Um, you know, particularly at that point, while I was listening to a lot of poppy music, it was really more of sort of the new pop out of the UK. And this seemed to bell more towards American M.O.R. It just seemed too middle of the road. So... I didn't pick the album up right away. However, 
the moment the show was announced, it was like, we're going. I went out and got tickets right away. There is no way I was going to miss this show. And once again, the three of us who had gone to all the previous gigs that I mentioned uh, at the top of the episode uh, uh, went again, Lady B and Le Chateau. I remember that I drove this night and I picked up um, the both of them, each at their respective places. And I also have a memory that the night before, uh, Lady B had had a heavy partying night with another person in our group of pals, Count Mara, who I've introduced in the Ramones episode. And it had been a sort of a night of overdoing it, and she was pretty rough for wear the next day. Um, and I probably wasn't too sympathetic. I was probably a bit of a dick, so sorry about that. But, you know, at the same time, too, hey, I, I, we all did then. It's like, oh, I've got something on, but you just kind of overdid it one night, and you're just in really rough shape the next day. So we were all there, and unfortunately, she was there for this night. But she did go to the show, and I believe she enjoyed it. Now, the other thing is we got there kind of early, which, which I'm perpetually five minutes late for everything. So I'm getting better, much better than I used to be at that. But for whatever reason, we really timed it and got there early. With this show and the Costello show, they were seated shows, but the seats weren't affixed. It was a case that you went into this hall, which is about 2,000 seats, and just kind of first come, first serve. Now, in that episode eight on Elvis Costello, I talk about the student rent-a-cops who were there and it's like four years, they were just, un they were really unreasonable. And anyway, four years later, they'd finally taken the carrot out of their ass and were much more chill about things. And we got there and people were sort of milling around the front area, the sort of orchestra pit area, which was of course open. And they didn't, seemed to be telling people to sit down there, letting them hang out. So we were like, and we were some of the first people in. And a couple of people were right up at the stage, and we thought, let's just maybe mosey on over here and kind of just hang out here. We thought, okay, so if somebody tells us to sit down, we sit down. But they didn't. And there was somebody, I believe there was somebody standing right at the front of the stage for a bit. And then they moved and I just kind of jumped in there and planted my elbows on the stage. And no one said anything. And this, everyone planted their elbows on either side, filled up. And there you go. Bob's your uncle. We were left alone and we were right at the very front of the stage. For the first time ever, I watched an entire concert right at the front and in the middle. Bonus. Now, one of the weird things was we hadn't heard anything about an opening band, which was unusual. You always had opening bands. You know, I'd never been to a show without one. Well, nope, another first, because pretty much right on the dot at 8 p.m., Joe and his five-piece band began the night. That's also another thing, concerts starting on time. In the 70s, you, things just never started on time. That's the way it was. And this was this shift into the 80s where things were running a little more clockwork. And I have mixed feelings about that. Part of me really missed kind of the old school where the concert would go late and everyone was more like, hey, all right. At the same time, it's kind of nice when things start on time. It's, 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 I have mixed feelings because I come from that era where things were a little less corporatized. Now, in terms of the, the show, what he was going to be playing, that sort of thing, I wasn't sure what to expect because he'd, you know, really been doing this genre hopping and I'd only heard the one song. So we kind of went into this, like we love Joe Jackson, haven't heard the new album, don't really know what to expect from the show. And let me tell you, were we ever in for a surprise? This show turned out to be one of my first experiences, especially along with the Talking Heads in 1980, which I've mentioned several times, wherein I went to see a one show, I went to see a show and was expecting it, you know, to be really good. But what was delivered was leagues beyond 
anything I'd been expecting, anticipating, whatever. And with an artist presenting a startling and superb new musical direction. Now, three key things really stick out in my mind uh, about this evening, thinking back. And the first is the band, the, the band themselves. And the second is the performance of the material from Night and Day. It was a pretty novel lineup at the time as there was no guitar player. So this was unique considering that his first few records had been so guitar based. In terms of anyone familiar with the original band, bassist Graham maybe was the only holdover from that uh, original Joe Jackson band. The remaining four musicians played a variety of percussion and keyboards. And I was particularly impressed through the show with this multi-instrumentalist he had playing with him, Sue Hajopoulos. And she was a brilliant musician and she had a real presence on the stage. So I spent a chunk of the night really focusing on her and what she was doing. And I know someone who saw one of the other shows on this tour and he said the same thing. He had the same experience. And because percussion was such uh, an essential musical component of this new group, whatever it was, Sue was playing made a really distinct impact on the sound. As it turns out, Jackson had been living in New York City, and he was now influenced by a lot of the Latin-based music he was hearing there, and that is a, forms a big, big impact on the Night and Day album. And the songs on the album represented a more sophisticated approach than what was present on his earlier work. And even though I hadn't heard the album except for stepping out on the radio once or twice, the material that really impressed me was the stuff from night and day. And when I think back to that evening, the performance of that material in particular is what really lingers longest in my mind's eye. They opened the show with a terrific version of On the Radio from I'm the Man. And then Jackson and crew went right into another world, literally and figuratively. This is the song that opens the LP, and it's also the song that announced that this was the introduction of the new material in the set. And the band's performance, they were so captivating, coupled with Jackson's superb tunemanship, and this exhilarating new sound, the warm blend and the needlepoint dance between the instruments. As the lyrics state, I stepped into another world, and that's what I and everyone else did at this concert for the next three hours. The outside world didn't exist. We were mesmerized in Joe Jackson's zone. Unsurprisingly, this amazing collection of musicians pulled off a wonderful version of Tuxedo Junction, which Jackson had recorded on Jump and Jive, and also... They did this Motown medley, this unexpected late in the night Motown medley that was incredible. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's the ultimate, you know, yuppie cliche of the 80s. This is 1982, and this is before everyone else was doing it. And also at this time in the early 80s, it was the start of my going back to a lot of music. I've always gone forward and backwards. And at this time in particular, I was really going deep into 60s and 70s R&B of all different flavors, which included Motown. So this was particularly germane and perfect for me to really see and enjoy this medley. And it spoke to me at this tuxedo junction in time. Also surprising was how well the earlier Often guitar-based music came off in this rearranged milieu, especially the ones I remember were Sunday Papers, I'm the Man, Beat Crazy, and of course, Is She Really Going Out With Him, which performed here, it was performed as a to-die-for, largely a cappella reimagining of the song. So, you've got the marvelous band and the performances of the tracks from Night and Day as the first two memories that always rush back to me regarding this gig. Then there's the third thing, and that's Joe Jackson himself. A wee bit of a curmudgeon. He seemed enraptured when performing 
and proper ornery during the spaces in between. And he was really perturbed when audiences responded at undirected times or in degrees that he felt disproportionate or insincere. And he gave a tongue lashing to some loud rap scallions in the crowd about clapping thoughtlessly and too often. Only clap when you're truly impressed, he directed. And of course, that triggered a whole new round of applause. And okay, remember, I'm just a few feet away from him at this point. He's standing at the mic doing this. And I saw his face close up. And I can tell you that at that moment, he had malevolence in his heart for that audience. Jackson responded with an expression so pained that you would have swore he was recalling some horrific memory, such as the news of his beloved pet, Noodles the puppy, getting run over, as opposed to, say, a spirited crowd bringing the love and joy. And, ooh, he got his knickers in a right twist when some highly exuberant person dared to interject during his long but effective introduction to a slow song, once again going all misanthropic on our asses. Yikes! I got to bask in that dark glow of curmudgeonness at close range. Of course, I enjoyed the absurdity of it all as well. I'm sometimes entertained by the darndest things. What can I say? I'm a bit of a cockeyed optimist in these kinds of circumstances, so there's a bit of South Pacific for you as well. The great news is that Joe Jackson, the musician, easily won out over Lord Grumpy Pants. We left with our spirits soaring after such an amazing evening of music, even Lady B, who wasn't feeling that great, which also says a lot about music's healing power. And also, best of all, we got to see it right from the front of the stage. How cool is that? I remember we were still kind of hepped up after the show, and I believe we went down to Singapore's downtown for a drink. Little did we know that in a few months we would pretty much be splitting our lives between seeing music at Freifogel's and hanging out at Singapore's, but that's coming down the line. So, the day after the show, I immediately went out and bought the album. Um, there was actually a thing on the back of the program that they gave you, which you can see on the website, where if you handed in your ticket, you'd get a dollar off the album, which I did. I later lived to regret that. I wish I had kept it. Um, there's a photograph of Ms. P's ticket online, but it is not mine. But anyway, I went out and bought the album, took it home, put it on, and I was disappointed because that rich warmth and all the nuances well it had nuances but i just felt it, it was a little stiff and clinical for me versus what i had just seen on stage and heard on stage the night before i just felt the production was a little too clean jackson later went on to record that big world album in front of an audience i wish he had kind of done a mini tour with this material and then recorded the album after because even now when i wrote this blog entry back in 2011 on open salon i really went back and listened to all of his albums and i gotta say i really like night and day much more now and i kind of re i kind of discovered it later on but still it's always i wish there was a little more blood in the recording and in the original blog entry I said that the, the difference between the two was night and day, but maybe that's overstating it a bit. But I will say that I always wish that there had been a live recording of this album or from the tour of the album. And in prepping for this podcast, 10 years after the written entry, I made a huge discovery. Now, I know that he had performed on Rock Palast. Now, that was a German music show that was on. I didn't know of it at the time. I discovered it when YouTube came around and all these episodes from the show have been posted. And there's so many incredible performances from that show, especially check out David Bowie in 1978 on the stage tour with that amazing band he had. He's got an incredible epi Rock Palast episode. Now, I had seen the footage 10 years ago of... Actually, Jackson did two episodes, one in 1980 and one in 83. And I watched the footage in 83 and I thought, this is it. This is what I remember from the concert. 
and I just, but still there was no live recording. Well, I found out that back in 2012, uh, the Rock Palace sessions were released as a double CD live album, but I've only just discovered this. And so I put it on and I'm listening and what I hear matches my memories. This is exactly what I remember. And so what I've done is I have two playlists, Spotify playlists that I have designed for this episode, and you can access them uh, on the blog entry on the mylifeinconcert.com website or go to Spotify. Uh, and of course, various artists is my username, but it might be easier to search on M L I C prompt that precedes the name of each Spotify playlist. And I have put together a live version of Night and Day. It's, it's all the tracks taken from the Rock uh, Palast album, except for one recorded in 2010. And it's the, the cuts from the album in sequence, but live versions. And I have been playing that version that I've put up, this live version of Night and Day. And I feel like finally I get my wish decades later. Also, I have up a Joe Jackson playlist of my favorite tunes of his from the 79 to 82 era up to the show uh, called One More Time, the best of Joe Jackson. So uh, check those out. They're embedded in the blog entry and you can also access them on Spotify. So back to the original Night and Day, it of course went on to become a huge commercial success for Joe Jackson spawning two hits of course stepping out which we've talked about and then breaking us in two so did incredibly well for him and for me this album really kind of is the end of that classic first five albums that he made i followed him through the decade and i liked stuff off all of the albums that came later i wasn't as familiar with his later material but i kind of been playing catch up and i've come across all sorts of great tracks but those first five albums remain my core favorites. Although having said that, I honestly think that my new favorite Joe Jackson album is the Rock Palace double live album. I've been playing it and it is, I, I just wish I'd known about this years ago. It's such a great album. Now, as for this show that I took in, how would I rate that out of five stars? I would give it six. It was just that good now i did finally get to see joe jackson again but many many years later at ottawa blues fest thursday november 7th 2016 and he had bassist graham maybe with him and i'll tell you he blew me away all over again an incredible performer an incredible set if you get a chance to see him do not miss and way 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 down the line i'll be talking about that concert if i live that long uh, as it's number 194 in the series of course we're at 13 now so that's a ways away well this wraps up my look back at joe jackson's october 4th 1982 concert at alumni hall in london ontario canada up next this was another memorable show, but for very different reasons. The next episode takes place just over three weeks after the Joe Jackson concert as Iggy Pop comes to town in tow with Toronto's bandaged electronic mummy, Nash the Slash. I first and finally got to see Iggy the previous year when he gave a spirited performance at Police Picnic 81, a festival I covered in podcast episode 15, The Boiler. For this second show, he was coming right to my hometown at the iconic Wonderland Gardens. So, how did this set stack up against that first one from the previous year? Please return next time, dear listeners, for musical scuffles, pushed buttons, and a mini lake of spilled beer as I bring you episode 20 of the MyLifeInConcert.com podcast series entitled Gimme Danger. Iggy Pop with Nash the Slash, Wonderland Gardens, London, Ontario, Canada, Wednesday, October 27th, 1982, concert number 14. I'd like to thank listeners, both new and returning, for taking the time to listen. 
please remember to check out the mylifeinconcert.com website for the original 2011 blog entry for this concert that also features links to videos and music along with uh, personal ephemera from the time of the show, including, as I mentioned, the original program that was handed out at the show. There are also lots of entries for other concerts spanning the 70s through to the 2010s, so please visit and enjoy. Also remember to like, follow, and subscribe on our Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram pages. And please leave your memories of any of these gigs I'm talking about on the platform of your choice. Thanks once again for listening. This is your host, Various Artists, signing off, and we'll meet up at the next concert. See you then. Bye for now.